Okay. No way, it's under. Thank you very much, and I'll, uh, we'll start without any further ado. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I won't talk about neo-fascism and the new extremist movements that uh, are marginal to my topic. Of course, it has something to do with it, obviously, but I'm not talking about revival and survival. Uh, neither, basically, that have been already satisfactorily described by other authors. And what I really would like to show you, well, always provided that I'm right, which is not sure, um, that are some elements of fascism and of national socialism that have manifested themselves again in the new circumstances after the Second World War and especially after 1989. And I will talk about that. And at first, there's this little text in, on this invitation leaflet flyer. Uh, and I, I'll have to repeat some of it. You know, we have to take uh, into account a few facts about the original fascist and national socialist movements in the 1920s and 30s that most decided, uh, decidedly won't be repeated and are not repeated today. Those were movements, first of all, sociologically, of veterans, of war veterans. The troops of the fascist parties, not only the paramilitary troops, but the membership, have been the disappointed and bitter and impoverished young sons of uh, the lower middle classes and to a certain extent of the working class and others who came back from the war and tried to claim their inheritance and who found that such an inheritance didn't exist and they had the feeling that they have been had, they had been stolen, they had been robbed of the meaning of their life and uh, of their future and other things. So um, that, was, that was the social context in which these movements developed. Well, we don't have such a thing. Militarism doesn't play a role that it did before. Uh, you know, the, the membership and the troops of contemporary fascism are not war veterans. It happens. You know, it's an exception rather than the rule. And, <coughs> and in general, in contemporary society, the standing armies don't play an important role. It's not about uh, the physical coercion, keeping order, that is actually uh, one of the main players of advanced countries' political life, so that the military aspect is secondary if it exists at all. So that's a very important thing. But even more important than this, sociological given, is that uh, 
fascism and national socialism, I will call it fascism for simplicity's sake. Uh, fascism has been uh, and remains to be a double-edged movement, a movement uh, that is a movement of rebels, a subversive movement directed against the establishment, a revolutionary or counter-revolutionary, but anyway, a subversive rebellious movement, at the same time directed against the other kind of subversive and rebellious movements, those that are emancipatory, liberating and rationalist and universalist, as indeed the old left had been. So the main adversary of fascism has always been socialism, of both the uh, uh, social democratic and the communist anarchist council communist etc hard left kind and this has been forgotten I'll go into that why is this forgotten uh, you know Hitler and the ideologists of national socialism were pretty clear about this they actually coined a term that may sound f familiar to you but it isn't the word Marxist had been used by National Socialism as characterizing all socialist forces on the left, communists and social democrats, and what they called Kulturbolshevismus. Yeah? Uh, you know, uh, uh, which of course didn't mean any Bolshevism, it meant the subversive creation of an adversary culture that. Uh, doubted the most uh, core values of what had been conceived of as the tradition, you know, the family, the nation, religion, tradition, and the biological, na naturally given determinations of gender. You must throw back your minds uh, to the 20s when culturally, you know, communism has been represented among other people by such figures as Wilhelm Reich, the uh, chairman of the Institute für Sexualpolitik, uh, one of the most radical uh, institutions and movements for sexual emancipation and uh, gender liberation that has ever been. And it was it was uh, emphasizing the liberating force of the recognition of gay sexuality as a variation on what has been considered natural and wholesome and good in the traditional view. So, you know, communism didn't appear as it appears to the generation post-89 as a conservative, rigid dictatorial regime, but it appeared in all its subversive anti-natural grandeur because all conservative worldviews of course are representing a traditional order that is being perceived as natural so its necessity is not moral it is you know conservatism is not Christianity conservatism believes in tradition not in religious truth there's a difference uh, because because tradition is given and truth is discovered there's a difference there too. So, so when, when uh, uh, conservatism assumes a natural order, that means that the adversaries of the orders extolled by conservatives appear to these people as being unnatural, artificial, or morally deficient, and which of course has been most successfully and effectively explained by ratio theory. So what was the explanation uh, of subversive theories appearing, theories and practices, appearing uh, when these were seemingly opposing the natural order? That meant that the proponents of that unnatural practice and theory are somehow naturally different. In you know, German's case, of course, and Austria's classic Jews, 
but anyway, but that's not, you know, that has been, of course, uh, you know, the cutting edge of racial theory. But of course, you know, people were talking in 20s, Vienna and Berlin, about uh, European societies becoming black, <coughs> negrification. There was no immigration. Still, they were talking about negrification and so on. So, so, so it has been explained well, you know, in terms of nature, of course, when you defend against the establishment and against subversion, the rejuvenation and rebirth of natural order, which is the idea of fascism, of course, a rejuvenation, a revolution, a rejuvenation of traditional order, re-establishing an order that has been compromised by various factors, capitalism and communism, right? which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it, how this came to be identified in the fascist imaginary and, uh, and not wholly stupidly. Um, uh, you know, then, of course, the explanation had to be not moral, not social, but biological or natural, you know, with a fictitious biology and the fictitious natural science. Never, nevertheless, it used the metaphoric of nature. And which is still one of the uh, strategies of conservatism. You know, how do you explain today uh, the uh, social inequalities? Well, you explain it uh, uh, saying that the people who are in inferior socially are inferior intellectually. Yeah? They, are, they have a lower IQ, they may not be independent, enterprising, bold, flexible, supple, fast, elegant, clever, you know, adaptable, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, you know, that, so that, that's, that's not fascist in itself. Uh, but naturalistic explanation after fascism and communism is not what it used to be before. As anybody, that's a, that's, that's, that's a commonplace, it's a cliché that, for example, anti-Semitism and racism after the Holocaust is not the same as it used to be before, which is quite true, you know, it's, it has lost its innocence, if it ever had any, because I don't think really that imperialist racism in the British Empire, for example, is a very vicious, uh, you know, was especially innocent, but certainly its genocidal uh, consequences were not plain to see, but now they are. But be it as it may, um, the, uh, the, uh, the great enemy was, of course, the rival movement, communists, socialists, etc., uh, anarchists, uh, the rival movement that presented an other diagnosis of what was wrong with capitalist society and an other solution, a solution which has been in keeping with what conservatives and fascists thought that was compromising the natural order, that is the Enlightenment, modern science and modern philosophy, and the secularization that's a result of that, and so on and so forth. Now, because communism, although uh, holistically subversive, was still an heir to the Enlightenment, especially in its form, uh, you know, of, of the, the second and the third international extolling technology and science and development and progress and all that stuff that has this teleological idea of history, and the productivist paradigm and all that. So it was recognizably the heir of that movement, of that theory and that practice that has been uh, uh, classified under the, uh, the, 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 the uh, title of, uh, of uh, enlightenment and which of course both enlightenment uh, of course enabling the bourgeois order to get uh, inaugurated and rooted and communism that continued this dynamic by switching it from an order of exploitation and inequality and oppression and reification into an order of abundance and liberation, but not breaking with the technological and natural scientific uh, dimension of modernity. 
so it was a very potent and, and dangerous rival and, uh, and of course it had been also most dangerously subverting what is of course essential for any society as we know it, social hierarchy, social hierarchy and that which of course always at the same time is a moral hierarchy and an intellectual hierarchy and a psychological hierarchy. It's an order of things in which the world is classified in a way in which it can account for inequalities, for lordship and bondage, for servitude and rule, for law, for obedience, for deference and for suffering justified. Basically one of the main functions any ideology is of course justifying or put it more mildly explaining suffering and make it even if not acceptable making it uh, uh, part of the social fabric which in its entirety can be legitimized well now you see since the enlightenment and its various offshoots Rousseau, Fichte, others and then of course Marx would say something that in traditional societies has never been said namely that suffering is not justified it's not justified what does Rousseau say that people are born free but they are everywhere in chains that means that suffering is not natural suffering is social it is rooted in the structure of society hence Hence, the moral obligation for enlightened and very good people as well, you know, would be liberation. And nothing short of liberation will do. And there's no method of legitimacy, be it religious, be it conservative, traditionalist, be it functionalist, be it anything that can absolve acting subjects and political beings from joining the cause of liberation. Now this moral injunction inherent in what people call between you and me the left don't, don't tell anybody uh, is, is you know uh, something that appears frankly and sincerely without any kind of hidden evil motives appears to the, the, the defenders of the existing order as pathological, as lacking the wisdom of uh, understanding the human condition. You know, uh, the Old Testament or Homer or Shakespeare or Dante will account for human suffering as fate, as order, as inescapable destiny and wisdom comes from looking it into the face. Well, that's tr what we call tragic. Okay? Tragedy recognizes suffering and gives it a meaning. Even uh, the, 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 the meaning of, of irreducible uh, absurdity is a meaning. And so you see the fascists uh, who uh, came to the fore in a, in, in a situation of enormous social, economic, cultural tragedy, which was the end of, which was the First World War, in which more soldiers were killed than in the Second World War. The Second World War had more victims because more civilians were killed. The actual battles of the First World War were bloodier than the, even than in the Second World War. And, uh, and also, you know, what was considered to be a traditional order, disintegrated as well, no, no, well, you know, famous. Uh, English politician said, you know, in August 1914, that, you know, lights go out all over Europe and they won't be lit again within a generation. So that feeling of darkness and tragedy was there. And if you had to account for this disaster that beset humankind, you know, you could go in, indeed in two ways, either in the, in the sense of emancipation and liberation, 
or in the sense of rejuvenating the traditional order, replacing aristocracy with a new warrior caste, replacing the worker with the kind of worker that Ernst Jünger, in his immortal and evil book, Der Arbeiter, uh, you know, formulated, uh, you know, reversing you know, the heroicizing of the entrepreneur at, in, in Werner Zombat and Schumpeter, <coughs> making, you know, the, the subaltern fate of the work into an adventure and so on. And so also, also of course, extolling and the backdrop, before the backdrop of wholesale human tragedy, the virtues of the soldier. And when Jünger, perhaps the most important, the most important uh, Nazi author is not Hitler. It's uh, three important Nazi authors, of course, Ernst Jünger, Martin Heidegger, and Karl Schmidt. And, uh, and uh, well, those are the important ones. We won't talk about idiots. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, when Jünger says, you know, in his, in his other immortal and evil book, Der Kampf als inner Erlebnis, you know, struggle as an interior experience, experience of the soul, as it were, you know, he wouldn't say like the old patriotic poetry that to be a soldier is a glorious thing. No, he says that is, it's, you know, it's being, being submerged in modern blood and dishonor, uh, and which is again confronting and accepting fate that has no consoling aspects. You confront tragedy as a soldier and you assume sin because you are a killer, right? So, so you know, this kind of tragic, you know, uh, worldview was and remains, and remains. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the basis for the Weltanschauung of, of the fascist movements. And, you know, and, but, but, but that again, of course, it has lost its edge because you don't have a socialist movement. The alternative of emancipatory and liberationist mass movement that mounts in whatever form a real challenge to the traditional order, which you know uh, uh, really really reverts and 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 turns around the traditional hierarchies, which puts the worker at the top and the masters and the lords at the bottom of the moral hierarchy. The first time it is, of course, the hammer and the sickle and not the crown, and not the lions and the eagles of feudal uh, curse of arms that are, you know, at the, at the top of the symbolism. So, you know, that kind of deep subversion that uh, was always perceived, not only by fascists, by no means, by liberals and conservatives alike, that is introducing barbarism that actually is against civilization, because it means the rule of the vulgar, of the uneducated, of the rough, of the people working with their bodies, not with their minds, and whose life is drudgery, not heroism. Well, that appeared to conservatives like you know, Ortega and these people, uh, Spengler, what have you, uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, you know, <laughs> and other reactionaries of the old school, um, um, appeared as a breach of civilization. Yes, this is what the communist movement proposed. To put an end to a civilization that, according to them, uh, meant the rule of things, not of persons. That didn't mean, you know, the the, the domination of the spirit, but of a very interesting thing, you know, an abstraction. According to Marxism, you know, capitalism is not a, an other kind of personal rule, but it's a machinic system steered by the anonymous and impersonal principle of accumulation and growth. And where, you know, the uh, developments, i.e. the commodification of everything, 
even of, of, of elements that have always been considered, always, which have been considered to be uh, the property of the community, land, air, or money that had been only an instrument of exchange. It wasn't a commodity to be bought and sold, as Karl Polanyi has shown very convincingly. Again, the, 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 the role of, the, of, of, of money as a commodity is new. <coughs> and, but, but in this respect, the abstraction and the universalism of capitalism is opposed by communism on the same level. Both are abstract as befits the nature of modernity, of capitalist modernity. Capitalism being this abstract in the personal system, according to Marxists, can be addressed only at that level. The essence of the Marxist critique of capitalism is not, although it's very strong moral principles, it's not a, not a critique based on the idea of justice, not, a, not an idea you know, that is based on, on a notion of equality. And uh, those are consequences. Those are consequences. Even class formation, so important in the history of the workers' movement, is a consequence. It's not two groups of people as such, of different origin, social, and so on, that are confronted with one another, but people thrown into different social categories by the workings of capital. Now, so the fascists, without, of course, understanding very, in a very subtle manner all this, but they have intuited that there is indeed something in common between <coughs> capitalism and communism. <coughs> this kind of universal, abstract, and conceptual character where uh, uh, you know, passions and traditions and beliefs play an, a secondary role. And you know, all this persists to a certain extent, but without the adversary being there. So now, you know, talking of post-fascism, which is of course a contemporary, contemporary phenomenon. Now, you know, what remained uh, after 89 in the contemporary world, in advanced societies, I'm not talking about the East, and not even about the Middle East, which is relatively a different matter, but not completely at all. But but my terms of description, especially are, you know, European, Western, whatever. Uh, so after 89, after the demise of the remnants of a failed and compromised liberationist movement, uh, be it uh, communist, be it anarchist, be it welfare, social democrat or whatever, uh, Contemporary societies are still trying, in spite of the props given in the whole of the Enlightenment tradition, heritage, not tradition, um, although that's weakened, they're still trying to keep aloft, to keep up uh, a society that has some universalist features. Citizenship, equal citizenship equality before the law, uh, a number of impersonal principles that ought to be imposed on any state, any rule, any government, uh, in order to ensure the primordial equality of all human beings. That is the basis of a rule of law that can vouch for liberty. Now, that is dependent, that is dependent, this idea of, of late liberal order, including that of contemporary liberal capitalism, uh, global capitalism, if you wish, or whatever. Uh, it is predicated, predicated on the continued preservation or upkeep of the universal notion of citizenship. That means, that human rights, in, in liberal parlance, human rights can be separated from civic rights, i.e. human rights are not only uh, defensive notions of what it means an individual in his or her 
private sphere being defended by law and the state from undue interference, but also the right to act, the right to act in defense of yourself, of your group, your ideas. So therefore, the ideas of the anti-fascist consensus after 1945, embodied in you know, the UN Charter, in Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Helsinki Declaration, blah, 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 all that, ensures, ensures that human rights are seen as this double-edged concept uh, of passive human rights, of being defended by this legal system, but at the same time, not only uh, 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 defending people's rights to act, but also extolling them to do so. And the whole thing is dependent on the idea of active citizenship, participation, etc., etc. Now, <clears throat> when this idea of universal citizenship is broken, then something very momentous and, in my opinion, perilous, dangerous, is happening. And of course, it started not exclusively, but uh, you know, with the, with the new international and national legislation about migrants. But migrant populations have been have not been recognized their civic rights in the countries where they emigrate. So there's a sharp differentiation between citizens and non-citizens. When citizenship stopped being, well, it was always notionally so, but when it stopped being considered, even legally, to be as fundamental as the human rights, i.e. the defense of the individual in his or her private sphere, well, then a new dynamic started to take place in the modern capitalist societies in deep trouble about continuous legitimizing of their continued existence and order as the enemy, you know, Soviet bloc or what have you, communist parties in the West, you know, the new left, various liberation movements and so on, started to, to, to disappear, began to disappear. Then, of course, the idea that our societies are legitimized by the fact that they are not dictatorships, and no tyrannies, that are not abusing the recognized basic rights, then, of course, the discourse of rights have been scrutinized more thoroughly by the remaining uh, sequels of the old left and, of course, also by, by, by conservatives. And the result has been conservative victory in which the natural, the traditional and the cultural entered again the legal universalism of original liberal capitalism. And others followed. We live in societies today in which biological differences uh, make up uh, 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 sufficient grounds for discrimination. Not only race and not only uh, origin and not only uh, civic status, but also things like age, things like health, things like uh, gender, and so on, uh, sexual orientation. So these are differentiations imposed in negation of the universalism of the double order of passive and active rights, human rights and civic rights. So human rights are granted to everybody. The state is not supposed to kill people and imprison them if they're innocent, supposed innocent, assumed innocent. But uh, at the same time, it can allocate resources, establish social rights, uh, design social redistribution, according to differentiations that in their origin, or at least in their imagined origin, are natural. Uh, this is why it's so important 
to take to heart the feminist critique of natural discriminations against uh, between uh, women and men because you know it was the, the feminists were for the first to show that what appeared to be natural it wasn't but so it could be enlarged this kind of critique to age and health and sexual orientation and race and other things as well these are all social constructs doesn't mean that they don't have an origin outside social construction you know, we all are born and grow old and die uh, but that is not constitutive for a different moral status adjudicated so by contemporary societies okay but this huge change would not have been possible without being sustained by a huge change in people's thinking about human society which I call post-fascism which after a long interruption a long interruption wants to rejuvenate and to relaunch traditional societies in which hierarchy is legitimized is explained and shown to be good uh, in the way of showing, you know, these post-fascism is moralizing and biologizing things. So showing that those people will get the short end of the stick who merit no better, who if getting the ascendancy, the superiority in society would destroy the fabric of civilization, in other words, to go back to Nietzsche uh, in order to be able to speak frankly, what did he say against Christianity and socialism, which were for him the great enemies, rightly so? Uh, he said he thought that the uh, social help, the artificially constructed social help in the interest of the weak falsifies the natural way in which human societies are shaped, in which excellence, the Aristotelian arete and the Machiavellian virtue, true, yes, that's a good analysis, are showing human excellence in differential terms. Not everybody is excellent, not everybody is good, you know, in the Greek sense of the word, you know, being both uh, grand and good, which means, you know, the megalopsychia, you know, the, the magnanimitas, the, the great heart, the great passion, the great mind, you know, the dimensions given to selected individuals who should be, of course, the leaders, the rulers, the thinkers, and, and all that. If you uh, will use procreation, inheritance and law in order to make the losers win, make the weaks be powerful, you revert natural order and hence you are destroying civilization. This is striving for excellence, striving for quality, striving for something better. Now egalitarianism of any kind and liberation of this kind, you know, uh, giving, you know, the gays, the women, the um, cripples, uh, the, you know, the foreigners, the dark-skinned people, you know, the ugly, very important. Have you thought ever about the commercial cult of physical beauty? What does it really tell society? What does it tell society? Who should be admired? Well, the beneficiaries of genetic accident okay happen to be good looking according to the prevalent taste whatever and so so this this uh, competitive agonistic uh, order rewarding the strong and punishing the weak rewarding the clever and punishing the slow and so on and so forth you know, punishing the rigid and rewarding the flexible, the supple, the fast, the 
you know, quickly adaptable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that society, of course, is a civilization because it embodies the striving for a greater perfection and so on. Now, and this has no adversary, no real adversary. For the first time in history, equality appears to be the slogan of Lebensfremd elites, of elites alien to life. Lebensfremd, Körperfremd und Sippenfremd, you know, alien to, to the race. Zippe is the, of course the good old Nazi word for, you know, our kind. Um, and so again, the explanation, the explanation of uh, liberationist and egalitarian moods, we don't have anything better than that, moods and experiments are again by neoconservatives and post-fascists and various other people uh, being criticized as being inimical to civilization, which is again equated with the natural order. And this natural order is also merged with what is perceived by, by these radical conservatives as the deepest nature of capitalism. That again is recognized, you know, that's of course the passive revolution uh, described by Gramsci, you know, this is why, you know, uh, communism in a demonic way comes back as its, countervailing, its, its own countervailing force and its own enemy because you know, this abstract character of capitalism is recognized by contemporary post-fascism as being the abstract order, you know, extolling competition, driving people forward, uh, uh, you know, demanding energy, demanding a fighting spirit, demanding action, uh, as opposed to the cowardly, slow culture of dependence, who would help the weak with social assistance and redistribution and all that kind of stuff. Now, and this is sustained by a very strong, sometimes subdued, sometimes, sometimes openly expressed, strong sense of hierarchy, which is not the inherited, not the traditional, but is rejuvenated and relaunched, re-inaugurated by a political uh, a dynamism that will sanctify and justify inequality in a radical and active way in which excellence and civilizational perfection called success uh, is uh, being the object of a cult and in which the pride again of belonging to the successful, to the winners, to the, to the victors, to the rulers has reconquered its glamour and its glory that has been lost under long decades of egalitarianism and socialism. It's a tremendous change, but we live within it, therefore it's not so conspicuous. But looked at historically, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, caesura, an a fantastic change. And, and so, so you see, uh, defending civilization and defending the natural order always needs what? Needs violence, needs violence, needs coercion, and needs the justification of coercion. And, you know, just look at such banal, very banal, very everyday, very prosaic, very mundane things as, for example, the neoconservative criticism of, you know, Obama's plans to reform the health system. Perfectly everyday politicking. But just looked at more carefully. What does it say? What are the arguments, which I looked into to some, some extent, very interesting. What are the arguments? The arguments are not that it would be a bad thing for everybody to have an affordable health care. Nobody would dare to say that. But it says that since the nature 
of society is that goods are scarce, scarce. Uh, that all the budgets will be only very, it will be very difficult to balance. That, that, uh, that resources are by necessity limited. The natural solution would be to let various groups compete for scarce resources and nature will take its course and show by the free competition that which are the deserving groups that should be emulated and followed by others. So the fact that health is becoming, re-becoming a privilege, that for example a dignified old age which has been presumed in the social democratic age of the welfare state to be an aim for everybody to end our lives in dignity and without excessive pain and suffering and all that, that would of course would mean you know resisting the natural course of life, keeping alive those people who don't deserve to be kept alive. This is the ideology of Auschwitz. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that was the, the expression of the Nazis, life undeserving of being lived. Good, this is why they used euthanasia and, and exterminated cripples and the mentally ill, gays, etc. Et uh, and even people, some actually uh, uh, non-hereditary illnesses, as you know, syphilitics and so on. But, uh, but you know, the same idea that actually the agonistic spirit of a non-Christian but traditional society will decide in a natural way who deserves to be on top, who deserves to be on the bottom, who deserves to be an active citizen, and who should be just a subaltern, obedient, servant of the masters of the universe, which are of course we white men, Europeans. Well, we East Europeans are called the second layer of that, but still there. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and so this is not, this appears to be innocent because it is not opposed. That's what it is. Why does it seem innocuous? You know, people say, oh well, you know, there are all sorts of reactionary legislations and all this, you know, mercantilist and you know, neoconservative dispensation about social policies, pretty unfriendly and anti egalitarian but you know, there'll be another cycle of government and you know. So it's being, you know, banalized, which it shouldn't be, but it can be banalized because it's not resisted by a real rival. It's not that we are lacking in criticism of that. <laughs> Any hundred of books, hundreds of books are criticizing these policies and so on. But that's not the point. The point is there's no world historical rival to this. It's the only show in town. And we people here we may be grumbling about it, but we are naturally a minority, and minorities are in this new dispensation conceived of as being necessarily a minority, because they represent the wrong principle. They represent the principle of civilization broken up in order to serve the inferior value, to oppose excellence, to oppose superiority, to oppose quality, to oppose triumph, to oppose the pleasures of victory, rule, superiority. And so this is why you have nowadays this, this idea that governments should finally govern, battles should be won. Uh, people should act, this kind of activist vocabulary from the ruling classes. 
that are again not simply trying to traditionally keep their power and shut up about it and try to present it in an innocuous and innocent way. No, no, no. The ruling class now, which cannot be of course totally identified with post-fascism, but using some elements of it, you know, but certainly held and sustained in its endeavor to keep a hierarchical order in place by post-fascism that reunites the dynamics of fascist biopolitics without needing the recourse to tyrannical methods. There's no rival. Why? Why should they uh, ban all parties when all the parties stay the same? Why should they ban the work, work, workers' movement when it doesn't exist? Why should they ban rival theories when those are ensconced safely only in the academe? Just we are just not dangerous, right? So therefore, there's no, no real need for you know so-called liberal democracy and parliamentary systems and so on being totally, totally uh, switched off. And you don't need the military, you don't need the Gestapo, you don't need anything like that. But the dynamism of this fatal link between nature and excellence is kept up by this new ideological dispensation I call post-fascism. It can be called something else too if you are more inventive in, 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 in putting labels on things. But, but you see what I mean. And the dynamic is fundamentally not identical but strongly similar to that. It is again an attempt, an attempt to relaunch hierarchy when basing it on tradition and on religion is not any longer possible. Because don't believe for a single moment that the new religious movements are identical with old time religion. That's not true. That's not, that's not what it is. Because these movements are religious expressions of various kinds of social despair, but most certainly they're lacking what? Exactly the theological character. It's not, they're not about God. You know, all the heresies and the great religious, religious wars were about very, very fundamental cosmological and theological problems that uh, moved people because of their uh, differential and variegated understanding of the whole universe and the human universe within it. Religion uh, 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 serves in, in, in some areas uh, only as a method of self-understanding, which is not what religion was. Religion wasn't subjective at all. It was on the, well, think of St. Thomas Aquinas. What kind of subjectivist was he? And, and uh, well, exactly. And <laughs> none at all. And, and you know, and uh, so, you know, so these societies in which we live are, of course, secular, modern, godless, if you wish, societies. Traditional nationalism is dead. The civic nationalism, democratic nationalism of old is not there, which of course supposes the equality between the peoples. That's the idea of national self-determination, national independence, is you know, based on the, on the assumption of the equality between peoples. Where is it? We have, again, you know, the white man's burden. Imperialism is reborn. You have armies, white armies, in the countries, as they were called, of the colored man, as Kipling would have called it, and, and others. And, uh, and people would say, you know, when, when, when American official ideologists would say that they're exporting democracy, that sounds very Robespierrean, but it isn't, uh, because they're not exporting a revolution, but exporting a counter-revolution. And, and that is the old order. Right? I don't mean anything very you know, flamboyant about that. And, uh, and it is the parallel of the white man's burden, of the mission civilisatrice, of the old imperialists, 
and uh, uh, from Baghdad to Belgrade to Kabul to Bamako uh, you have the white man's burden assumed and acted upon which is not the main thing about this of course but but it shows that the ideals be they as hypocritical as may have been in the good old bad times of the welfare states east and west uh, a shift has been operated and this shift is sustained by a very deep ideological mutation and in which uh, people might resist even conservatives might resist the most brutal and open forms of neo-Nazism, but not post-fascism. And uh, there are some things that are not permitted by the powers that be, you know, open anti-Semitism is frowned up and such like, but of course Islamophobia is not. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, but quite apart from these political details, it is quite clear that the contemporary society had a very distinct biopolitical direction in which moral worth and biological aptitude are linked and in which civilizational excellence is grounded biopolitically and hence the universal citizenship that is civic activity and the right so civic activity is not universal any longer. They are active and they are passive. That means they are rulers and they are servants. Hence, end to equality. Hence, the end of the Enlightenment project. Not only to socialism. Not only to socialism. And that is the aim of fascism. What is the aim of fascism? To put an end to Enlightenment. As it is. So when, you know, there's this very strange thing, uh, you know, which I'm sure you have noticed. The liberals say that liberalism, that fascism and communism are the same. Totalitarian, all that. Uh, Stalinists say that liberalism and fascism are the same. Fascists say that Marxism and liberalism are the same. Capitalism and communism are the same. This is the core of fascist politics. They were sincere anti-capitalists in the sense of uh, being the opponents of an unregulated commercial society, adepts of a kind of state capitalism based on these biopolitical dynamics. But the, 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 the um, deep structure of their thought really results in identifying the abstract this worldly and uh, egalitarian tendency inherent in liberal capitalism and in the versions of socialism. Now, yes, well, this is exactly what we see today that the post fascist consensus will assimilate the m most modest liberal reforms if they are egalitarian and they are emancipatory even in the most mild and innocent manner is communism. This is why poor old Obama is called a communist in uh, America. I've just seen a book in the Algorithm bookshop in Zagreb called The New Red Army. Well, the New Red Army is Obama and his staff in the White House. Well, it, it, it sounds crazy, but it isn't. It isn't. Of course, it's crazy in terms of a proper description of reality, but it's not at all crazy in its elan and uh, its, 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 its drive uh, to annihilate the protective, humanistic, egalitarian propensities of the remaining last vestiges of a liberal society which, unbeknownst to many people, is in its death throes. After state 
capitalism of the Soviet variety, a liberal society that is agonizing. And it is according to the post-fascist agenda that these two deaths are somehow synchronized. Well, this is, of course, a total falsehood, but never, nevertheless, in their minds, these are synchronized, which are explained for outsiders in terms of, a, of an attack of what both in their imaginary, both communists and liberals sustain, namely the role of the state as an agency of redistribution and the moral office establishing social justice. So these attacks against big government, statism, redistributionism, dependency culture, social assistance, you know, um, state handouts, as they're called, you know, state handouts to underserving people who wouldn't work hard, but where? Yeah, who wouldn't work hard in order to, to, to look after their own and making the personal effort to keep up the old homestead and whatever. So this, this ideology of blaming the state as a common agency dear to all enemies of this new kind of liberty is of course totally insincere but it shows what they mean. What they mean is that any rational correction of the national order I might draw your attention to the fact that we are not part of nature. We happen to be human, and indeed, uh, biological drives are not our only motivations. So, therefore, the correcting of a natural order is a perfectly general case of human endeavor. Pretending that some social arrangement is bad because it's not natural is intrinsically ridiculous, if you wish, because we are, we are not animals, you know, we are human, hence there's reason, there's a new element in evolution that interferes with competition and chance and such like. Now, attacking that and extolling the intrinsic tragic virtue of blind competition, which means, of course, gain and loss, superiority and inferiority, triumph and defeat. Well, that, of course, is fascistic. And it is dominant. And so, of course, post-fascism is not totalitarian, it is not militaristic. This is why it is post and is perfectly reconcilable, as we can see, with the prevalent contemporary political arrangements. It is all pervasive, in some elements of it are everywhere, and it has a great success, and it influences, in part, the thinking of some of the best of us. And I thought that it was perhaps my duty to draw your attention to this, because something that is so all-pervasive is difficult to discover. Thank you. understand this historical phenomenon, I mean, historical fashion to describe it. Um, and, well, um, the discourse you described, it's, it's, it's elitism, it's, it's, um, it's uh, aristocratic, uh, basically, contempt for the masses and, and so forth, and seeing itself, this elitist discourse of, of uh, order, of, of restoring uh, proper ranks and so on and so on, well, one could argue 
uh, that, that doesn't catch fascism uh, as a historical phenomenon because that's true for every form of, of reactionary uh, tendency from Nietzsche and so forth uh, and so forth. Uh, I th and of course, fascism in part has fed from the, the tradition and it is uh, a continuation of that tradition. But I think what historically, what historical fascism as we know it, what makes it specific was the need to, um, to merge this, this type of elitist discourse with the mimicry of the revolutionary rhetorics of the left. Because the NSDAP, the National Socialist Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, well, there is an SWP hidden in there, you know? Um, <laughs> at least if I name. Well, you know what I mean, you know? It is Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, I mean, so it's <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, you know what, what, what uh, no. so, so this is the important aspect. So, it, from, uh, and this is why many people have argued, well, fascism as a coherent ideology, in fact, doesn't exist. Of course, its motivation is elitist, but there are so many elements in it which are basically uh, a mimicry of the revolution, of the discourse of the revolution. Oh, this is lacking now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm talking about the historical, the, the historical uh, fashion yes. uh, version part. And, um, of course, um, <clears throat> well, um, the second point would be that the success of historical fascism as, as a mass movement, it, uh, we know that um, it uh, it depended, of course, on, on the old elites who were at first distancing themselves, especially in Germany, from Hitler. He was too bad, too flabbed. He had the SA because of this quasi-revolutionary quasi discourse. Yeah. And we know that the class differences between the SS and the SR. In the SS were the aristocrats, and the SR were the real plebeian elements, which were perceived by many of the ruling elites as really dangerous, as, as, as a version of, of the socialist trend. And, um, and it took some convincing to do and some negotiations and a crisis, a real crisis of the old elites whose parties were losing, uh, were losing, uh, um, they had no mass spaces while, while uh, the socialists had of course their mass spaces, they had their infrastructure, they had, they had the unions, they had and so on, and so did the communists and they were growing in influence. And, and uh, of course we know that uh, at the end of the Weimar um, uh, election, the last elections, uh, the, the uh, SPD and the Communist Party together had more votes than than, uh, than any other party, and the Nazis at their peak had 37 percent. So, uh, so it was the elites who. who um, so there was an instrumentalist aspect to it, and that and that makes me challenge the assertion that they were genuinely anti-capitalist. There were elements of that, but if you look at the NSDAP's program, uh, I think in from 29. The, uh, 19 points or something, or 14, I don't remember now. Uh, some of them were pro-capitalist, they were in favor of, you know, this social Darwinist uh, emphasis on, on struggle of the, uh, the free market, but uh, social Darwinism as a coherent social theory was developed in defense of the free market in the 19th century. Uh, uh, in, on, and fascism takes a piece of that, of course. So, um, and if you look at this uh, at the program, some elements were of course anti-capitalist in, in their in their um, rhetorics, but none of them were implemented. All of the others, of the, all the pro-capitalist elements, in fact, were implemented by the NSDAP once it was in power. So, uh, mm, because in this way, it's um, so it may be pedantic, but I think it's it's historically important to to uh, to have that in mind. And 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 you gave the, the um, and of course the historical context was precisely because the revolutionary left uh, was so strong that, that the only way to contest it uh, was to mimic it to a certain extent. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so two points. I agree with many things you, uh, that you said. Uh, you know, the thing is that, well, first, it's not the same thing to uphold the traditional elites or to be elitist. And, and, and the fascists have replaced, they made their alliances with, you know, some of the nobility and the military caste and so on and so forth. Yes. And of course, but I didn't say that, that I, I didn't think, and if I gave that impression, then I apologize that they were genuinely anti-capitalist. Of course, the genuine anti-capitalists are the genuine anti-capitalists. And those are not the Nazis. And, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, it has been established by Austro Marxist actually, that's already an article published in in in, in the late thirties in the Prague emigration of social democracy and, and uh, statistical tables that show that there's one common element after fascist parties come to the government. The lowering of real wages. Of course. 
that's that's you know, I, I assume that this is known and also uh, Mussolini for example uh, had the most impeccable uh, liberal budgets balanced budgets low taxes etc etc so of course they were very much very much uh, a prop of capitalism but we must make a sharp differentiation between upholding the capitalist system and preserving the historical political power of the bourgeoisie. So that's in, in that respect I think that Friedrich Pollock and others have been quite right in emphasizing that uh, the last remnants of political power of the bourgeoisie uh, of the Bildungsbürgertum and of the traditional big bourgeoisie were indeed uh, uh, interrupted uh, with the Machtergreifung, with the taking, uh, Nazi taking of power. And they have, of course, infused this political activism and super activity and dynamism and planning and so on, with taking over political power from uh, the traditional ruling groups. That is true. That doesn't mean that but this is a political change, very important political change. It was never quite complete. That's also true. But, but, uh, but uh, most certainly it was indeed the NSDAP and not any kind of traditional Heron Club that would have determined the policies of Nazi state. That was quite clear. But quite apart from that, so I, I would concede most of your points and uh, and there's another, you know, when you say that this kind of dynamic uh, elitism uh, existed before, yeah, well, you know, there's an essay by an impeccable liberal, Sir Isaiah Berlin, about Joseph de Maistre, who was originator of fascism, which I think he was, actually. Uh, I think uh, that's, that's quite correct. Uh, but there was a minority phenomenon. Joseph de Maistre never quite uh, uh, belonged to the ruling ideologists of, of the restoration period, although he had some following in St. Petersburg, of all places, and so on. But, but there were, of course, precedents to historical fascism. Uh, the most dynamic and imaginative part of, 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 of reaction, and so on and so forth. Everything has predecessors. But, but, but I don't think this is quite true. But that's not as decisive. As, as you might, and of course fascism is continuation of the old reaction in many, many ways, but there's a difference there. The intuitive idea uh, bruited about by, by, by the Nazis was uh, this idea of elites coming out of the struggle. That's a very important intuitive idea and that was also in Italian fascism and so on and so forth. Re this rejuvenation, this cult of youth, that's it, which we see again, but never mind. Yeah, uh, this was very important. <coughs> and and to, to what extent was this a reality? Very little of it. Was real. That's true too. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they did not uh, anchor the sense of tradition. And this was, of course, the well, not rev revolutionary, but certainly subversive, anti-establishment part of this. And the, uh, as to the mimicry, yeah, I would say there was such a thing, but it was mostly the zeitgeist. It was, it was, in you know, the main story of the 20th century is the story of socialist and communist movements. That was how people talked and thought, especially in moments of crisis. If you read, for example, the review Ditat, no, no, Tat only, without the article, of Ferdinand Fried and others, so-called revolutionary conservatism, which were friends but not identical with, friends of the Nazis but not identical with them. Uh, they were more, more strongly anti-capitalist than, than the official ideologists. Uh, what would they say? That the new national revolution, as it was called, the new national revolution, uh, so beloved by Heidegger, uh, meant, meant uh, the triumph of youth, of people who come from the trenches. It was not anchored sociologically. 
It was partly the new middle class, the employees, you know, the Angestelten, about whom, of course, Siegfried Krakauer has written very presciently and very, very, very intelligently, and, uh, and partly workers and others, but mostly people who came from the trenches and who have shown their ability to lead even the economy by their ability and willingness to die. And that's a very important thing. So the, 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 the reconstitution and rehabilitation of traditional heroism and military virtue uh, have been indeed, indeed differential traits of historical fascism, which is not the case any longer. It's not the case any longer. There's no heroic dimension to post-fascism. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Sorry, my next replies will be shorter. <laughs> no? Wait. <laughs> Well, then I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No, 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 wait a little, wait a little, wait a little, wait a little. Okay. Well, people may think and, you know, you know, we didn't come here Especially to... those who don't have chairs. Yes, you know. Uh, monologues are all right, but not perhaps the best. Yes. As I understood, you insisted that uh, this kind of post-fascism, even if it becomes a kind of a mainstream uh, politics of today, uh, that it uh, is uh, somehow um, um, implicit or not, uh, but uh, it is somehow uh, um, fundamentally anti-liberal, uh, as, uh, as opposed to something you call the kind of liberal universalism. Uh, and you, if I understood you correctly, you um, gave the example of uh, the, the lack of uh, uh, citizen, citizen rights, for instance, for immigrants, which are then automatically excluded from the, from the human rights granted to all citizens alike. But uh, it seems to me that wasn't this kind of uh, cynicism always included in liberalism. For instance, the idea of of uh, all are equal before the law, just some can't afford the lawyer and stuff like this. Wasn't this kind of cynicism and always towards the working class, which is, all, uh, um, which is also today uh, we must uh, realize that uh, the, the, the issue of uh, migrant workers of Saint Pierre, for instance, in Western Europe is the is a class issue. They are mostly uh, the, the most. Well, yes, well, that's the art of the reaction to transform class issues into bio biopolitical issues. Yeah. Yeah, of course, you're right. I agree with you. And of course, well, well, I'm not talking about liars. Well, of course, they're always hypocrites and liars. But that's, uh, yeah, that's a different, you know. But, but you know, fascism is, and post-fascism too, the same, it's a consequence of liberalism and an opponent of it at the same time. So, of course, you know, the idea, well, liberalism, in as far as it expresses the underlying dynamics of capitalism, which of course is, one of them is, of course, is competition. You know, this, this, this blind drive for accumulation and growth, of course, will mean, you know, a scramble for the profits that will never keep up with the demands of growth and accumulation. There will always be losers. So, of course, liberalism has freed the ways for this competition, and in some phases of its development, had been indeed, especially at the beginning and the now again, you know, has been advocating unbridled, uh, unbridled and, and, and limitless competition and so on, and inequality and so on and so forth. You know, you know, the old emphasis on liberty as opposed to equality and so on. But, you know, in, in this, I, I remain an Orthodox Marxist. Uh, namely, Marx was the one thinker, and in this he was quite unique on the historical left, opposed to Proudhon and Blanqui and Sorel and Lenin, to some extent, namely that his problem was not that in capitalism there was no liberty and equality. His problem was that 
while there was liberty and equality in, in capitalism, why was the end result exploitation and oppression? Because it is not true that there was no equality before the law. Of course, there were all sorts of uh, all sorts of limitations. Those limitations has always been biopolitical. For example, when you know, you know what the universal voting rights were called in English in the nineteenth century: manhood suffrage. Yeah, you know, the, the, the voting rights for women were not even thought of. Manhood suffrage, and so the limits of humankind have always been constructively established. So the universalism of the former centuries have been limited to adult males, and of males who could be independent, that means who had property, that was the differential vote, voting rights in most countries until very recently, actually, that, you know, people who, you know, the virilists who could pay a certain amount in taxes, they had voting rights, because they were supposed in the old Greek manner that whoever has to vote for his living, his yeah, living, for his bread, uh, for somebody else, was in a servile condition, therefore uh, unworthy of the high title of citizen. That's always the case in the Greek city republics. It was called banausia. It was the condition of the working poor, as they're called now, who are free citizens, but since they are dependent on their employers, and, emplo and also dependent for their livelihood on the pleasure of their customers, for example, artists, who have to sell their works. Hence, they are dependent on the buyers. Hence, they are not free. Hence, they can't vote. Only free people can vote. And those are very, very, very few who can. So that was, but that was universalism that was imagined to be limited, not by a wrong anti-egalitarian moral and social decision, but by natural uh, boundaries. You know, dependence is the servile condition of somebody who is not completely human. Well, this is what Aristotle thought about slaves, and this is what, you know, Athenian laws thought about the unfree. Right. And, uh, and you know, uh, the, um, the uh, liberalism in its, in its striving for uh, legal equality and its version in classical republicanism that aimed also at political equality, that is equal participation even of indigent citizens, poor citizens, in, 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 in politics and, and, and you know, plebiscitarian methods, etc., etc., responsible governments, you know, uh, various methods uh, in appointing various ruling bodies and so on, you know, softening up and making subliming some, uh, uh, power. Uh, that, that kind of dynamics of, of liberal capitalism, that, that ambivalence and that self-contradiction, which you pointed at very, very correctly, of course, you know, that, is, that is what has always been a result of the class struggle. Obviously, why was limited? The class struggle also had moral consequences. When the subaltern classes have shown that they have strong aspirations for participation and of a greater share of this world's goods and so on and so forth, this was recognized by the liberal ruling classes at some kind of cooptation and dialogue and compromise with the, with the proletariat. Of old. So quite right that rebiologizing some of the subaltern classes that are adjudicated most dangerous because of less rooted and so on and so forth, whose cultural practices are different and so on. That of course is going back from to a to a state from before liberalism and the liberal niceties of, of the welfare state and so on and so forth are in danger. Which is not I'm not liberal. But you know, but 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 there's a difference. But there's a difference with liberal societies, and societies with a with a deeply anti-egalitarian drive of post-fascism. Post-fascism, of course, is not a tendency or a party; it's a diffuse 
but all pervasive ideology that influences various circles and various powers. It's not it's represented by any single movement. It is penetrating many forces, including so-called left forces, you know, uh, British Labour Party, with its ideology of uh, stakeholder society. That who are the full-fledged citizens who have a stake in the continued existence of the present order. Now, if you ever, ever heard anything reactionary, is that, you know, the Giddens, Blair, uh, etc., communitarian, blah, blah, you know, theories of, uh, of having a stake and of being a full-fledged active member of the procedures that keep things going instead of government taking responsibility of ensuring legally and politically uh, procedures that are conducive to social justice and equality. Yeah, of course. So, so you see, this is a phenomenon which doesn't have to take the forms of a party. It is, it is uh, one of the characteristics, well not only one of course, but one of the characteristics of the age. It is most brutally represented by some, less openly by others, but certainly these transformations can be observed. Of course, for the sake of brevity I was simplifying some of the things, but, but I think you get my drift. So. All right. Any other hands here that maybe you see? No? <laughs> no, and, and don't get discouraged. <laughs> Thank you. Thank then, you. Uh, no more questions. Maybe somebody will join us for drinks and ask things in a more informal way. I would like to thank uh, Gaji for joining us. And at the beginning, I forgot to uh, also thank Center for Worker Studies, with whom we are organizing uh, this lecture. So thank you once again. Thank you, too. Thank you, too.